The central area um, essentially is a swath of the, Seat the center of Seattle that extends from about 23rd and Rainier, where Rainier runs into 23rd, all the way to, on the north, to about Thomas Street. And uh, on the west, about 14th, or you could go to 12th Avenue, and on the east to Lake Washington Boulevard. And that area was an area that was redlined. And redlining um, indicates that there is a geographic area around which or within which African Americans could live. Those were the only places that they could live. So in, the, in Seattle, the central area was the only place that black people could live. And that was a legislated law. Um, essentially, if someone rented or sold to a black person outside of the central area before 1968, they were committing a crime. I mean, punishable, but not necessarily punishable, but it was a crime because it was legislated that you could only rent or purchase a home within the central area. So while that was the only place that um, black people could live, it was also populated by Italians, Asians, Filipinos. It was a really diverse community, always was a really diverse community. The red line was from Franklin High School, really. I mean, it was like it was shades of red. You know, where the closer in you got to the central area, the redder the line got. But you know, you could kind of lean on the line and they wouldn't really bother you. But uh, from Franklin to all of Chinatown, all of Chinatown, so that's close to Pioneer Square, um, to, now, and I'm talking demographically now, because we were, we were able to live in Yeso Terrace, and that was so we could go down to Pioneer Square and it would be all right. So all the way over to past Madison, headed north, it was past Madison to, I would say, at least Republican Street, down, uh, and then east, uh, yes, the east side, all the way down to the lake, Lake Washington. And, and that was, and that was where that red line had different shades of red because we were just, a, just beginning to be able to move down by Madrona Beach, down to Lake Washington. Um, I would say that opened up in about the 50s, in the mid 50s maybe, there would be one or two black families that were living down at the lake and then it kind of grew and so I have to add that as a line because that, it was cut off before then, yeah. earlier, but then it, like I said, it started getting different shades of red. Martin Luther King, which used to be Empire Way. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, before it was Martin Luther King, it was Empire Way, but it's the center of the central area, more or less. It's a main street. Also, 23rd Avenue yeah. is a key street. Uh, Madison, because it's kind of the north border. Mm -hmm. And then um, on the south side, I'd say, um, well, Jackson's an important street in Yesler, but Jackson and Yesler, yeah, those are the key streets to me. Growing up, like I say, when, uh, the central area was Japanese, because a good friend of mine, best friend, when I, I met him when I was four years old. He lived across the street from me. Um, and then uh, my next door neighbor was a Jewish man. Uh, my, my sisters learned to play piano from the Jewish lady who lived across the street. She taught everybody in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But then in the 60s, guess what happened? But all over the country, there were riots in major cities. We had Black Panthers, we had black people were rioting. This is the way, I, you know, this is the way it was described. But there was resistance to uh, inequities that were uh, that they knew about, right? Mm -hmm. And they were trying to rectify them through housing and uh, uh, different means, job programs, and so on, similar to today. 
But it was really worse in cities like D.C. and Los Angeles. It was terrible living conditions for black people. So they started to literally riot and just burn down their own neighborhoods. In Seattle, we didn't really have riots. But now, all of a sudden, the people who all lived together, now there was tension between them because of what was happening in other countries. And we did have a Black Panther Party. And the Black Panthers were simply trying to educate our children, mm -hmm. to feed our children, and to and to um, really uh, gain some some strides around jobs and housing and so on. And so, and and they did really. They actually accomplished that. But the people, the Jewish people, and the, uh, all the white folks, the Japanese, anybody else who lived in the community who was not black, started to move out. And they literally, Jewish folks, because they worship yeah. the synagogue, they have to walk to the synagogue. Mm -hmm. They moved the synagogue out. They moved everything, moved their houses. And Langston Hughes, which is an old Jewish synagogue, became, they in some way gifted it to the community. So it became the Langston Hughes Cultural Arts Center. But all those communities left, and more black people moved in. That's why what you end up with, in about by about 74, it was almost entirely an African-American community. Langston Hughes is um, very important culturally um, for Langston Hughes Performing Arts Institute um, because I think it allows us to share our voice. It allows it's a place where we can go and be comfortable and share our stories. And, and also, we're, it also allows us to invite the new people to the neighborhood and to hear about black experiences and black culture. Um, so I think it's a very dynamic hub and important place for us to be. I'm proud that the Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas office is there now. I'm proud that we're able to program regularly out, out of that building along with the new Langston nonprofit, along with um, the summer musical will be there for the Seattle Park off Seattle Parks and Recreation this summer. So I'm proud of all of that and the energy in that building has really um, transformed in the last year. 23rd Avenue is kind of run right through at Jackson Street. Cherry to some extent, but I think Union and Jackson are the sort of big intersections that come to mind. And in my world, of course, Coyote being at 23rd and Cherry. Garfield High School. It is, Gar it is at Garfield that most of the black high school students up until the 1980s in the whole city of Seattle attended because when Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, spoke at Garfield in 1961, uh, Garfield was the only school in the state of Washington that was over 50 percent African American. But he said that we have to work on opening up the housing all over the city and we should not be confined to living. This is Martin Luther King Jr. In one neighborhood we should have the right to not be segregated uh, and that we should have the right to live wherever we desire in the uh, greater Seattle community. That, so that started uh, the uh, fair housing uh, movement in our community. Also, most of the civil rights struggles, like the boycott of schools by black uh, youngsters, the creation of the Black Student Union, the start of the Black Panther uh, Party, all these things uh, and demonstrations and activities uh, the beginning in 1983 of the first uh, tribute from the community to the legacy of Dr. King began at Garfield High School. So Garfield has been a, for the movement, Garfield has been a, a central uh, uh, entity here. And then Garfield Playground itself has turned on some fabulous, Garfield Gym and Garfield Playfield have turned out some fabulous young African-American uh, athletes uh, over the years, from Charlie Mitchell to Levi Fisher, Willie Campbell, um, uh, Larry Gossett, uh, all kinds of uh, great athletes. The greatest woman basketball player uh, to ever live, Joyce uh, Walker, attended Garfield and graduated there in 1980. So another symbol of this community has been the great young, dynamic black athletes that have come out of, uh, uh, of this uh, neighborhood. And just the whole civil rights and black power movement, organizations like the 
uh, like CORE, Congress of Racial Equality, SNCC, Student Nonviolent uh, Coordinating Committee, Black Student Union, all began right here in the CD. In the CD. So in terms of um, landmarks or areas that have been named after people, there is the Quincy Jones um, Theater that is over at Garfield High School. And then for Ernestine Anderson, um, the area three blocks between, I think, 20th and Jackson up to 23rd um, is called Ernestine Anderson Way. Um, then you also, of course, have Langston Hughes in terms of the Performing Arts Institute. And um, the James and um, Janie Washington, their home um, has been turned into a nonprofit and an institution in the central area as well. Um, and there's hopefully going to be others, especially with the work that we're doing in relation to establishing the uh, HCAACD as an arts and cultural district. I also mentioned the Heritage House and the Cotton Club. Those are really important places um, for me as a young adult where I could go and have access to some of the best entertainment. I mean, I saw Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, Teddy Pendergrass, all kinds of people right here in the community. Um, just across the street uh, at 23rd and Jackson was one of my favorite record stores, the Impetus Records. So those were like landmark places for me. Um, at 23rd and Union, on one side of the street was a Safeway store and on the other side of the street was a Tradewell store. And both of my brothers, one worked at one, one worked at the other. Uh, I got a chance to kind of, you know, go back and forth. Um, St. Peter Clavier was also a really important place, um, and it was a um, was like a, a place that we went. We had dances, high school dances, and it it, it uh, was at 17th and Jefferson, which is now the entrance to uh, Providence Hospital. I grew up playing music, and my next oldest brother played trumpet, and he played with a couple of uh, individuals that I got a chance to see a lot of. One was Jimmy Heath and the other was Jimi Hendrix. And um, I will never ever forget, and speaking of landmarks, I'll never forget Jimi Hendrix's concert at Six Stadium where he reprised um, the national anthem song that he played at Woodstock. And Six Stadium existed where um, Lowe's is right now. There are different pockets of the city that are very different and, and just as much part of the central area. So I wouldn't want to limit it to a single street. Jackson seems really key. Everybody relates to Quincy Jones and the contributions that he's made to the music industry. I didn't have the pleasure of knowing Quincy, but I did know his mom. His mom lived in the central area just a block away from Garfield High School, I think until close to the time that she passed away. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that there were a number of legislators who lived in the central area. Peggy Maxey was the first black woman to serve in the Washington State Legislature, and she lived in the central area. Um, uh, Sam Smith was, I think, the first African American to serve on the city council, and he lived in the central area. And we have a park name for him. Um, which is really wonderful. Um, can't forget that Norm Rice was mayor, our first black mayor, and he lived in the central area and um, made huge contributions. And um, I'm going to forget his first name, but his last name was Fleming. Um, and he was also an African-American legislator who lived in the central area. Jesse Weinberry served on the uh, state legislator. He lived in the central area. I think he still owns a house in the central area. So um, politics was a part of our lives. I mean, uh, by the time I was your age, I had to be pretty savvy in what was going on in politics because it was important. Um, it was important to my family, it was important to the community, and it played a central role in how we became active 
in our community. It, it was a turbulent time in the nation. Um, and uh, I happened to be in the generation of those whose parents lived through the civil rights movement, and I grew up in the black power movement. So there was kind of this clash of generations, and we had to find our way. Um, I, can't, I should also, and it reminds me to mention the fact that um, the Seattle chapter of the Black Panthers was founded right here in the central area. And at 20th and Spruce, right across the street from the Odessa Brown Clinic, um, is the Black Panther wall that was painted by my art teacher, Dion Henderson. And one of the first free medical clinics in the city of Seattle was founded at 34th and Union. And it was called the Sidney Miller Free Medical Clinic that then became the Carolyn Downs Clinic. And 34th and Union, I also want to say, was where the black, where Black Arts well was located and founded. So art, culture, community, it was all present right here in the central area. Our culture, Ethiopian culture especially, you know, coming, coming here to 1982, I know so many African American people here, and I met a lot of them. I, this building upstairs, it used to be a Blue Moon Gallery. It used to be a gallery up there. I used to show art, uh, owned by African American. So those galleries were amazing gallery. We had shows from all kind of African American artists, you know. Uh, and also, I've been participating in a lot of art shows. It's called The Matter of Color, for example. That show I showed was Jacob Lawrence. I don't know if you know, African-American artist, I don't know. and James Washington. All this amazing artists, they're not here, they're not <laughs> right now, but uh, their work is all over the place. If you go to the Seattle Art Museum, you know, I had a show with them. Other mm -hmm. uh, Eric, and all those African-American people that I know, mm -hmm. and live around here too, most of them. And now you see what's going on. So we speak about the Central District and the Central Area, and what has happened um, and been, what has been contributed by African Americans. Homer Harris Park, which is behind the Meredith Matthews YMCA, and Meredith Matthews was an African American. And there's plaques along the wall, at least 30 of them, historically chronological of the contributions of African Americans. I invite people to go there and see that. And then we have the um, James Washington's studio. James Washington was a very renowned sculptor. His sculptures all over Seattle. And when he died, his family formed, he left a foundation. We have parks named after, we have the Sam Smith Park. We have the Flo Ware Park. I just mentioned the Homer Harris Park. We have the Martin Luther King. The city has invested in our history. Our culture, you look along Jackson, you know, that was a, where we had music. I mean, if you go up and down, we're still here. Like I say, when I go to Central Area Senior Center, and it's packed. They have lunch up there together. So um, we're still here. Maybe not in the numbers we were, but look how many Ethiopians are moving in. Are you different than us? Mm -hmm. Say, we don't see, you're melanated people. So the history goes on. But if there's a disconnect, and you have to dig a trench and start from there, the children will never, will ever get ahead. Stand on our shoulders. So right, we were at the Langston Hughes Theater yesterday and we had a recital with, um, the, um, with classical music, violins, beautiful um, um, uh, music. And Yahoo is a classical pianist and professor. He's from Ghana. Now who would think that he would be playing ball? So we have all of this. We have so much culture, so much history, and economically, African Americans worked at Boeing. We built those. So now what? We have to pull together. We all have some purpose and something to do. And the Central District, I don't think we'll uh, uh, ever not be that place that has an African American culture. Because look at Chinatown International. Most Asians don't live there, but that's their sense of place. And then we have Africa Town here. We've done so much that we've contributed. They even have a Japan Town I hear now. Yeah. And then Ballard. It's you know, so. Um, Yes, there's a lot of history, a lot of culture here, and we need to get out and, and do it. We were able to bring our our uh, culture with us. So Somalis have a lot of restaurants and businesses, and that's also 
show their dresses are different, you know, and that will be an influence in the people who are living in the, in the community. A restaurant also is a part of the, that contribution, you know. Sure. Our churches are part of our contribution and we organize in different form and you notice the existence of new thing in this area just by observing what's going on you know we were everywhere our churches are there with different kind of culture you know mm -hmm. uh, different totally different from what american population was used to so, uh, as the population number also grow, our influence also grow mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So, no denial that uh, we have contributed to the central community, even to Seattle uh, culture. Always heard about uh, the fact that Jimi Hendrix was from here, um, Quincy Jones, um, and then you have maybe artists like Sir Mix-a-Lot, and then you hear about individuals that traveled here and performed. So that's everybody from um, Duke Ellington to um, Billie Holiday um, to, to what have you that at one time um, either lived here in Seattle and or performed here. Um, so that's kind of some of the history in terms of the kind of music side. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of other aspects of the arts, I think about Jacob Lawrence, uh, I think about James Washington, um, you know, artists who were painting or sculpture and what have you. And then with literature or even with theater, I think of August Wilson and his time here and the work that he uh, did as well as um, uh, Octavia E. Butler and the fact that um, she lived here in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily in the central area, but you know, I think a lot of times by virtue of just association in terms of being a part of the black community, there's some type of understanding or relationship of their work having some connection to uh, the central area. The performers that I was able to perform with is, the mo is number one on the list. I mean, when you can perform with Kenny G, Major Lance, Stevie Wonder, Martha Rees and the Vandellas, Gladys Knight. I mean, these are all the people that I, as I was growing up, had the privilege and honor to, you know, be working with. Uh, I mean, I've just named a few. There have been many others that I was, you know, able to work with. That is high on the totem pole. But when you first asked me that question, the time that I remember being, I think, very, very full of joy was when we used to have the, cent the Central Area Black Community Festival. That was when, uh, on used to be called Empire, now it's called Martin Luther King, Junior, you know, street, correct, used to be called Empire, was when we used to have festivals at the Empire or at Garfield, because it was also at Garfield High School, the festivals where the rides would come in. We'd have, you know, big roller coasters and Ferris wheels and cotton candy. And that was when I had the most fun, growing up anyway, was each year looking forward to what they call, called then and called now, the sea fair time. Sea fair was probably the best time where a lot of communities, not just the CD, but a lot of people, the ships that would come in during Sea Fair Festival, they would come in and, and join in our celebration of Sea Fair. So Sea Fair, Sea Fair is what I remember and enjoyed a lot. Mr. Boas, uh, Mr. Boas, and I can't remember his first name right now, but he is the father of Sandra Boas Dupree, who is the operations manager at Langston Hughes Performing Arts Institute, and he was a jazz piano player. And, um, oh my goodness, uh, there's a story about him after he finished playing piano and that really wasn't his focus anymore, about um, him being a um, crossing guard. Um, and then one day being in the um, school and the piano was there and he's playing and the principal walks up and like, wow, who are you? And they end up doing a story on one of the local television stations about this jazz connoisseur 
that has that's living here and and doesn't have an ego very humble guy um and doesn't tell anybody who he was and what he did uh, we also have Khabibi Monet of New Black Arts West. We have Black Arts West. We have Umeme. Uh, I don't even know what Umeme's last name is. He just go by Umeme. Um, so we have those legends. We have Vivian Phillips, um, who who has contributed to a lot when it comes to this town. Um, uh, and there's so many. I I I don't want to. I know I'm leaving a whole bunch of people out because it's the spur of the moment, but you give me about an hour and I have a whole list off the top of my head. But um, I respect all of those legends that have paved the way for me to work at Langston Hughes, the Jackie Moscow's, the Steve Sneeze, the Royal Ali Barnes, um, the Justin Umecas who, who worked at Langston, Fel Felicia Loud, Isaiah Thomas. There's a lot of people that's come through. Um, Mr. Acox, right, at, at Garfield, his jazz scene. So there's just um, a lot of history, a lot of people who's been here in the CD um, entertaining and as well as educating and being a very vital part of this community. Best time of the year was the Black Community Festival. And, and I mean, really, my, my, like, my favorite time of the year is wow. in... It's July, late July, August. So much so that I got married in that week. Mm -hmm. But that, and what we would do is we'd go to the Black Community Festival. Why? Because we'd see everybody. We'd hear the music, we could just hang out, and every, the black community was there. I, I produced festivals at um, Seattle Center. And uh, just yesterday, we'd had our Black Community Festival, Festival Sundiata, it's called. And it just reminded me so much of that time. Mm -hmm. it, and wh where would we have it in, back in the day in the 70s? Garfield Park. The whole park, out on the field, right? The baseball field. Mm -hmm. The stage were out there. So uh, the field was just full of people, packed with black folks. And uh, that was always my favorite time of the year. The parade, you know, we have the parade. And yeah, it was a great, great mm -hmm. gathering. And you know, what I remember most this is what, you know, being an artist, this is what you do for people. You won't necessarily remember the performers or even what you ate, mm -hmm. but I can always remember how I felt. So back in the day, I was at the Black Community Festival, we had all these great bands. All the, you know, they were great to me, but they were local bands. Mm -hmm. So there was Cold Bold and Together. That's really an important one. Yeah. Because Cold Bold and Together, they were like stars to me. I mean, they were stars. They had a record. We had a radio station, KYAC. And we had, uh, these guys would come out, they would play, they had these two twins, one played bass, one played guitar. Tony Gable was on the Kungas. They actually came to Garfield, and I remember standing there watching Tony Gable like, ah, Acapulco Gold. Um, uh, let me see. 48 pounds, three ounces. These are the names of the groups, right? These are yeah. these bands. Uh, Bernadette Bascom was a well-known uh, person. And um, Vivian Phillips, Scott, it was Vivian Phillips Scott at the time, Vivian mm -hmm. Phillips now, she was a DJ on the radio. She's a partner with us. She is on the committee with us, with um, the Central District, the Cultural District. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we had a music scene in Seattle. The, the demographic ch shift is what um, I'm really referring to, where you go from a population of over 70% of black people in the central area to down to 7% of the population of, of black people. Um, and that indicates a huge demographic shift. Now, Seattle happens to be a place that never had a huge black population. I mean, I think at the at our highest, it was probably less than 15 percent of the total population in the state. Um, so it's not like, well, I think it is like black people have moved outside of the state for a number of reasons. Um, they've moved outside of the city of Seattle because of affordability, primarily. It's expensive now to live in this area. 
So there are there are a few factors, um, and one that I like to remind people of um, that contribute to the changing demographic in the central area. In 1969, um, Mayor Wes Allman proposed what was called the Thompson Expressway. And the Thompson Expressway was a expressway that would have cut a huge swath of 23rd Avenue from um, probably about Harrison or further north all the way down to I-90. So it would have connected with I-90. And the intention was that I-90 would be above ground at that connection right where um, the African American Museum is now. Because you know that I-90 just goes right by the museum, but it's under, under grade at that point. Um, and at that particular point in time, the state of Washington and the Department of Transportation specifically to do the I-90 expansion bought a lot of property that um, just north of Coleman School. So those homes were owned by black people and they were purchased um, to make way for the I-90 expansion as well. So when all of this was happening, people started to move out of uh, the central area. And that's when the suburb of Kent started to become very popular. You could purchase three times uh, the size of a house in Kent for about a third of the cost of what it would cost you in the city of Seattle. Um, and I know this because three of my aunts moved by 1972 from 23rd, 22nd, and Marion to Kent. So we started to lose our family to the suburbs. Um, and that continued to grow. People continued to move south. Um, by, the, by that same time, um, I think I, it would only be fair that I would also mention that gang violence was becoming um, quite horrific in the central area in the demographics. The biggest change, I would say, would be the demographic of the Central District. Let me tell you, the house where I live now, mm -hmm. my wife didn't want to live there, so we have to buy a house in Linwood to live there and rent this one because it was considered most dangerous neighborhood and it was predominantly populated by African Americans mm -hmm. as you know because of the history of uh, and the treatment of African Americans in this country uh, the economically the worst are African Americans the most discriminated people Probably now it become all over the world. Black people are not treated as equal human beings. That is, this was the source of the place. You know, this uh, Chinatown yeah. at one time was predominantly African American owned businesses, wow. nightclubs, bars, all kind. But now you don't see a single African American owned businesses. So that's, I, d I didn't understood all of this thing first, you know. Well, I've um, been in this community for a long time and we've seen a lot of changes. So one of the things that we're going to see is you're just going to see a demographic change. You're going to see a lot less brown faces and a lot more um, non-brown faces. And that's only an issue if everyone is able it's only an issue if no one's able to coexist. And coexisting is really, these days, is economic coexistence. Are they able to meet everyone's needs? Are they still going to have reasonable income, um, reasonable housing, and reasonable, reasonably affordable places to live? Or do the rent skyrocket and force people out? Because that even forces out a lot of the mid-range mid non-people of color. Um, I think we all know, just looking at other cities, it drives people that can't afford it out of the area. Um, it's going to drive, around, drive out a lot of grassroots organizations and businesses. I think originally a lot of the businesses intend 
to help and keep grassroots organizations such as this organization, MMRTI and SYVPI and all the small businesses, they intend to help them out. But the reality is when they drive up rents, they take the profit. So whatever small profit organizations and businesses are making right now, as soon as your rent increases by 30%, there's a profit margin, and now people aren't, aren't, are no longer able to operate their businesses and nonprofits and any other thing. So um, it's going to end up being not good for the community whatsoever. The population it used to be African-American. Now almost there are few left. So those are, this, that's the main change. And as a business owner and as an employee at the central district, almost more than half of my clients used to be African-American. That's not anymore the case. Mm -hmm. On the business side and the, even on the Park Centric Center, yes, there used to be a center for African-Americans, but now very few African-Americans are around. The same thing with the business side. So that's the main change I saw. The other changes are rents are going up, 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 and very few people start to afford to live here. Uh, I have friends, families who used to live around here. So they are not here anymore. They can't buy home here unless the people who bought when the price were low. So people are moving to SeaTac, to Birian, not only African-American, East Africans. So that's another big change. And businesses used to be around here. Some of them are closing. The one here, Emma Marti, I is here for almost more than a decade. Mm -hmm. In six, seven months, this will not be the case. So those are the changes I see here in Central District. Um, I went on a little vacation one day up North Seattle. Mm -hmm. Me and my wife went up here. And we stopped off at a little town called Linden. And it was Sunday, so the town was like shut down, right? Yeah. It's daytime, but everything was closed up. It's little, it's a little town. <laughs> and um, I looked on a wall and there was a big mural and it told the story of how, I believe it's the Swedish people found, founded the town of Linden. And they have all these images and all this art that is telling that story. And I thought, why is that so important? Well, it's important to the people who live there for the descendants to know that, oh, my descendants founded this city. So I have some ownership in it, right? I get to, I, I was here, I am seen. What do you, what do you young people say? Uh, see me, or, or another thing you all say is, you got to be woke. And woke is being conscious, being aware. Well, if you take the central area and someday there's no indication that black people lived here, then the black people who are currently living here and around, mm -hmm. they won't be, they have no identity, right? No connection to the past. I mean, everyone, I'm a student of the Bible. And what do you have in the Bible? More of it is history than anything, actually. The Old Testament, right? The history. And some of the chapters, what do they say? All the people's names. History is, is important. It's important because it gives us our identity. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to know just the history. I like, I'm just proud to say my dad had a master's degree in 1956. The black man went to college. He's probably the only black man in most of his classes. But he pursued that, it was important. So that tells me, Education is important. I need to make sure I have an education, and I need to make sure my children are educated. Um, but I think it validates who we are as people. It, it, it helps you to be seen. You walk down the street in the central area and you see that uh, all these great artists performing, and you have murals and you have buildings that reflect the, the history and the culture. Uh, it's going to strengthen your education. It's going to strengthen a sense of identity and belonging in this city. It will um, it'll really feed the future of young people. And I mean, that's white or black. I mean, that's like asking me, why is it important to eat? You know, it feeds our soul. It feeds our community. It feeds, um, we are not where we are today without the past. 
right? And so it feeds us. It um, it helps us know that we can we are stronger than what anybody thinks we are. That we can get through some things and still survive and still be strong. It helps us as a community, um, Black African. However, it helps us come together and know that we can build something. That we can that we can rely on each other when it comes to time of trouble. But we can also come together when it's time to celebrate and have a good time. It lets us know that we can do whatever we want to do, right? So having you here as a student, right, about to graduate high school, you see me as an executive director of an organization at Langston Hughes. No matter what you want to do, you know that's an option for you. And so that's why it's so important for us to continue to cherish our history here in the Central District and the Central Area and our history as black, African, um, what, however people identify because it's important for us to know that we can do whatever we want in the future and at the same time it allows us to know that um, we can be better than that as well right I always tell my nephew and nieces I want you to be better than me right I don't want you to make the same mistakes I made I don't want you to have the same struggles that I had but I want you to be better than me. That's your goal, is to be better than me. And I'm okay with that. And that's what I expect of you. That's what I expect of the young man behind the camera. That's what I expect of all our young people, to be better than what we are right now. Because you see our plight, you know our history, and now you can take it forward as the next generation and make us all stronger. It's good to know your past because it helps you to move forward. Knowing my past has allowed me to grow as a human being and everyone should, it's a right I would think of everyone to know their past so they can draw strength from it. You know that's why I, I believe African Americans are at a disadvantage and any other what they call minority but person of color were at a disadvantage here in America because we don't know our past, we don't know our greatness. And our greatness, if you look at it, has been for the world. It hasn't been a selfish, well, this is mine, da, da, da. from the pyramids on back till now. Most of what we contribute to mankind and the world is something that will aid the world, okay? Um, when People that are in control want to stifle other human beings, want to stop them from, from being a viable person, a viable strength for others, then that's, that's where the mess up is. The, the piece of it that would be most sad to, to lose in my mind, I think that's part of why the historic central area arts and culture district is so important, is to keep that identity and not lose what the history of that world uh, brings to the CD and to Seattle as a whole. Uh, that, that would be a big loss. And I think the, the now, the people who are here now, people of African, African American culture um, that, that could be embraced here is, is the best chance to keep the central area as a, as a unique part of town and, and a unique piece of the Pacific Northwest that it's just pretty important. It's, it's a bit of a juggernaut. It's hard to keep change from happening. That won't happen. But um, you can do everything you can to make sure you don't lose too much. We've been the only African restaurant, Ethiopian restaurant, for a long time. And at one point, Coco is known almost by every Seattle. When some American meet an Ethiopian, they will ask them, do you know Coco? Do you know who is asking this? The American. <laughs> you know, it becomes so, so popular. Mm -hmm. And it's become an icon to Ethiopia. Yeah. And, uh, 
our restaurant, the food also is different, mm -hmm. and it become very, very popular. As I told you, there was line to <laughs> get it. Mm -hmm. The Ethiopians brought the same culture, I mean, different culture. Mm -hmm. the, Ken the Kenyans, the Nigerians bring their own culture. Mm -hmm. And we like it or not, somehow that has some influence in the people who used to live there earlier. Mm -hmm. And they learn from us and we learn from them. You know, culture, we like it or not, it's not by formula or by uh, some kind of um, uh, plan mm -hmm. you influence other people's influence unless you suppress other culture you know but in a free society people come up with their own culture and it's so natural people learn one from the other sure. as much as we brought and contributed to uh, center district because most of the Ethiopians uh, concentrated and reside in this area because at that time it was predominantly uh, populated by African Americans. Mm -hmm. So this is where we first settled when we come from different part of the world. As I told you, this is a new experience to the Seattle population. And our way of eating is totally different than they are used to. Mm -hmm. uh, and we use our fingers, and we don't use any utensils. So that's one major changes and different than they are used to. And it's amazing. Some of the things happen at the restaurants by Americans might not think it happens as an, when you think about it as an Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. Most of the people when we present in Jera on the side, and what they did is, it's not one person or two person, several of them. Mm -hmm. What they do is, if there is their first experience, they think that's a napkin. And they put it here. <laughs> it is amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, but most of them, they told me, they like the idea of eating together in one platter. Yeah. And American, you know, is all individualistic way of life, and everything is shaped towards individualism and they eat by themselves, everybody's, you know, no sharing. So the idea of sharing, amazingly, which we think is natural for us, for them, it was a very strange thing. East African culture really influences some, for example, you are a high school student, I know for sure half of them, they know injera around here. I, will, I like I have a small store, and it used to be almost 90 percent. My customers used to be African Americans, and all of the, almost everyone who comes and tells me, "Do you have injera? Do you have tips?" So those are the things. It's slow, but uh, a, a big influence. So it's not that easy. Uh, I mean, simple. Uh, it takes a lot of effort because Ethiopians, Eritreans, Somalis open their f restaurants. They open their church mosques around here, they, it may not direct, but they become part of the central district. Most uh, central district residents, African Americans, started to move. A lot of Ethiopians, Eritreans also started to move south because the rent is expensive. But still, there are a lot of communities, they, want, they are still here. They feel this is their second home. Mm -hmm. I have a store for almost 12 years in central district. And I feel this is my home. I am very comfortable. I spend hours, years around here. So I feel really this is my second home. Yeah. So uh, I have a lot of friends. I work with a lot of African Americans and others. So that's how it may not be direct, but small, gradual influence here at the, the church around here, the restaurants, are uh, the symbol of East Africa. Uh, a lot of our 
East African youngsters love African American music, dress, the way they talk, the way they dance, the way they listen to their music. So the, the African American have huge influence on East African, especially on youth. And like I said earlier, we have some influence on East Afri in African American. Mm -hmm. It's a small because our numbers are small. So our influence is small, but still there is an influence. Like I say, it could be our food, it could be our music, our dress. It's a matter of time, but it, the influence will grow. Uh, but it's both ways, not only one way. Well, the program I'm doing uh, right now, uh, I work full time for Seattle Neighborhood Group, and I also do <laughs> community activists. Uh, also, I have a program, uh, senior meal program for Ethiopian and Eritrean. Uh, there are people, uh, the, the seniors who come to that program, mostly they speak Amharic, Grinyan, or, or Omifa. And been going for six years, and we're doing well. You know, like I have a lot of volunteers who come there like three days, and they cook for the seniors. And uh, we have a good uh, turnout and we are getting more seniors. And also what we do is our, some of our seniors, they are engaged in environmental uh, work. Like they go to the, uh, there is a ravine in Saudi Seattle where they clean, uh, they clean the uh, watershed, they clean uh, wetlands and they work together and they are learning how to be a steward of the environment, which is great. And they enjoy the work because it gives them physical activity and then it gives them chance to come together. And now we are very lucky. We have a beautiful garden in Rainier Beach. And now we have a kitchen, we have a meeting place, we have uh, greenhouses where we can grow our food for our kids. And we have bees, we have chicken, we have a lot of things going on there. And it's a beautiful, inspiring places for our seniors. So when our seniors come there, they can have their traditional coffee, they can do whatever, you know, suits them for activity. And I'm very uh, happy for that. And uh, the need for the East African seniors, this is mostly in Central Era, but the seniors come from all over. This is what happened in Yesler, you know, I've been in Yesler forever, you know. But throughout the years, I've been taking photos of young people, older people who've been living there. Some of us, some of them living, some of them there, gone, uh, passed away. And um, there, I took pictures. So they have this table made of marble. So they want to put pictures. And then they came and asked me. We give them pictures of Yesler East African community. And they're going to display it there, you know. And as you say, they. Uh, name of that place, Koboro, and then we are asking them, put more Koboros yeah. there, Koboros or Umbelta. <laughs> so it's very important because for the kids, you know, I interviewed the kids who grew up there. They still come there. And I said, why you come there? Didn't you move 10 years? I said, you know, one of the kids who told me, he's 28 now. I said, listen, Michael, I grew up here. This is home for me. I have a lot of memory here, you know, the building and stuff, but everything is gone. He was, he had tears in his eyes, you know? And uh, we have to put a reminder for those kids, you know? This that's their home. We are longing always for back home, right? The town, the village we came from, but the kids, they grew up here. This is where they have their friends. This is where they play basketball, the community center where they used to hang with their friends, you know? So uh, it's very important. For even organizations such as yourself, we are the hub of where these young people come. So once you remove the stability out of the lives of young people, um, it hurts. So myself and my staff, we're all wondering how it's going to affect the kids. And unfortunately with, unfortunately with young people, you really don't know how things affect them till six months to 18 months down the road. Because originally, everyone takes change and they try to adjust and then it's when they're not able to adjust, when they don't have a place to go, that's when you start seeing the backlash. So um, we as an organization are saddened by, you know, the purchase, especially since it's looking how it is. You know, um, they've come in and they've said, you know, the place has been purchased and we would like you all to stay around a little bit longer, which means, you know, continue to pay some rent until they figure out exactly what they're going to do when the fact is they already know what they're going to do or they wouldn't have purchased the place. 
So um, it's going to be a rough transition for the entire community. Um, you know, it's going to drive up rents in the entire community. And a lot of people that you're seeing right now as of today will not be here um, this day in two years. So exactly 24 months from now, you will not see the majority of these families or faces running around through this area. Um, I just want to give the messages, you know, we have to be responsible, you know, like uh, what makes us uh, uh, look good is when we engage our community. We have to be at the forefront fighting for our rights, for our dignity, and for our economic growth. And uh, nobody is going to come knock at our door and invite us unless we get out and knock doors outside of our houses. So reach out to other communities and work closely and also engaging the lo local government when there is election, when there is disaster, when there is something happening, we need to come out and raise our voice. The more you come in great number, the more they will listen to you. And it's up to the new generation, they can articulate things because they are uh, proficient in, the, in English and African languages, so they can you know, spearhead these movements which can help the community as, at large. So I think it's very important. Uh, what I always say is sometimes we have to uh, put uh, the differences aside and work together. It will make us look and wise. Yeah. Well, the advice I would say is we all need to begin to branch out and figure out where we can be successful in other small markets around the city. So we'll have to be a little more adventurous, um, which can be a good thing. It makes us step outside of our comfort zone. Um, we also need to talk to Vulcan and tell them the importance of what they're doing and how this is going to play out down the road. Um, you know, Vulcan, you know, they also own the Seattle Seahawks and they also own the Portland Trailblazers. So they make a lot of money and, you know, so we're not only their potential renters, but we're also the fan base from the sports teams that they own. And, you know, so they have a lot of skin in the game as far as for the Seattle community. So it is very possible for them to buy property and not make a huge profit margin, which means they don't have to drive rent up. They have the capital to buy land and not drive the rent up. So we just need to advocate for that. And we need to have more of a one band, one sound approach where we're all meeting together and we're talking to Vulcan about who we are and how long we've been here and the changes that they're bringing to the table versus just kind of accepting it and moving on because there are some things that Vulcan might need to have done that they don't know. There's some help that Vulcan might need that they don't know because um, the community is going to change drastically. So they just need to know that and understand the faces versus, you know, they're displacing 2,000 people. They need to look at the faces of the 2,000 people so they can get a better understanding of what exactly they're doing.